childism, I'm sorry if you think it's silly, but can't think of a better term, and children's rights. So just very briefly, I'm not going to go through this in full, but there is a taxonomy of racism, which anybody who's worked in this field, this will be very familiar. You know, colour blindness is actually being blind to different need, marginalisation, seeing black people is not really part of the, the mainstream, et cetera, et cetera. And really this kind of taxonomy, you can turn it over and apply it to any group, uh, people with disability, to women, to any group really who experience discrimination. Um, and I had a, a kind of Damas road to Damascus moment, really, and it came from a child who was the son of a social work colleague of mine. And this was back in the um, early 90s. And she reported that, you know, my son says Britain's a childish society. And it just pinged a light on in my head, really. And, and, and I just thought, actually, we, we haven't done this exercise for children. Um, so really what I'm doing in this talk is this exercise, looking how does discrimination affect children? Um, what this slide shows is that discrimination against children is really quite complicated. You've got direct discrimination against children because they're children, and that's on the left side here. So it's overt discrimination, being blind to, to their youth, um, marginalised them, stereotyping, etc. But on the other side of the slide, you can see that children come with other um, attributes. Uh, they they can be black, they can be female, they can be trans, uh, they they could be living with uh, in situations that actually lead to stigma and disadvantage, like um, being homeless, uh, having a mother who has fled domestic abuse, etc. And so, for children, these discriminations are there's always at least two going on for a child, and often more. And so they're they're they, they meet a lot of jeopardy um, and it's some, something most of you will be familiar with as intersectional and it, initially this was a word that Xu An taught me um, about uh, two or three years ago. Is there a problem? Um, can everybody see the slides just to check? Can, be, can, everybody, can everybody see the slides? I, I can. Yeah, okay. Apparently dad can't, but that's, oh, on Facebook. that's a problem for him. Okay. Right, right. sorry, ma'am, carry on. Okay. Oh, I've gone sorry. too far. No one's on this one. Yeah, one, two. Yeah, okay. Um, so sh this intersectional was a word that Shuan taught me about, I don't know, three years ago, was it? And I kind of went, oh, I've been working in that for years, but I didn't know the word. Uh, because one of the things um, I did with, with um, some colleagues in the Race Equality Council was that we set up a charity uh, in the early 90s which went it, it lasted for about 20 years it got killed by austerity in 2015 like so many other charities in Wales um, but it was a charity to provide advocacy and support for the BAME children who uh, also were disabled and so it was intersectional in spades and, and we were dealing with the concepts although we we haven't actually met met the term um, <clears throat> So I'm going to first talk about direct discrimination. And because I'm a doctor, that's the world I know, I'm probably going to be putting a lot of the examples within a health context. So I'm sorry about that, but that's just my world. Um, I'm just putting this up here first. Um, I just want you to think about why I might be putting this picture up and I'm going to come back to it in a couple of slides. The best example of British childism is this. Uh, and if you look at the first, the first um, hotel on the left, I've changed nothing about this except the woman's uh, name. Uh, in the go it's in the Good Hotel Guide, and it's a classic British thing. Sorry, no dogs or children. You don't meet this on the continent. The only time I've ever met it in Europe, Europe continental Europe, was actually in a hotel in Minorca that was run by Brits, um, funnily enough. And then it can be even worse. Uh, um, there's another hotel here, this is from Scotland. Uh, children, not under 16, but yeah, dogs, they're fine. And in fact, Laura Ashley's hotel up near Bilth is the same. No children under eight, but dogs are very welcome. Uh, and and I, I always find this really offensive. I've always found it offensive. I don't understand how other people don't find it offensive. 
Um, and I actually rang the good hotel guide and I said, I don't think these hotels, because half their hotels were like this. I said, I don't think it should be new guide. Oh, why not? Well, they're just excluding half the human race. Not, it's not, that's not a good hotel. They thought I was completely mad, but anyway, made, made, made them, you know, just made the point really. Um, so, right, coming back, don't know if any of you uh, sort of got the link here, but this is a picture of a real mosquito, but there is a very unpleasant uh, piece of equipment called a mosquito, which makes a horrible high pitch sound that only youngsters can hear. And it's basically for shopkeepers and even people in their own gardens, um, if they want to annoy children and keep them away, they switch it on. Um, to our shame, this was designed and it's still made in Merthyr. And a lot of people have tried to get it banned because it's really horrible if you've got an autistic child who's not very verbal and he's got hyperacusis and they're in a shop and they're in pain and they can't tell you, can't tell their mother why. And their mother just won't know, or the father won't know what's, what's going on. Um, so, you know, we do have some issues in Wales and being the maker of the mosquito is one that I'm not very happy about really. Um, okay, marginalisation, what do I mean by this? Well, this is when children are just not seen as part of the core business. You know, they're, they're not really what something's about. And I'm going to talk about the marginalisation in the health service. When Blair came to power, one of the things they did was introduce this idea of national service frameworks, which were huge policy documents pulling together everything they wanted to um, get the health service delivering for and they had on kidneys, on cancer, on um, heart disease, etc. And initially, they had nothing on children. Um, and there was a huge uh, lobbying from my College of Pediatrics and from a lot of other child focused organisations saying, you cannot just tag children on the end of all these adult NSFs. Their needs are entirely different. The way these diseases present is entirely different. This is not good enough. So then the government thought again. And then they did put a children's NSF, um, but unlike the adult ones which had money attached, the children's NSF did not. So children's services were meant to just magic all these um, recommendations without any funding. Ten years later, when the Welsh government came into uh, into being in the early in the early noughties, um, what they did was come up with a lot of health targets, and their initial targets apart from one in maternity, included nothing on children. Um, another example is Children's Hospital. If you, it doesn't matter where you go in Britain, uh, you go to a huge, big um, uh, tertiary hospital, look around for um, the Children's Hospital, and you'll find it's often one of perhaps two or three, or perhaps the only building in that whole um, development, which has been built by charity money. And I don't know where this comes from. I don't know why Children's Hospital has to be built with charity money, whereas all the other bits of the hospital come out of the NHS. But that's been a pattern for decades. And then another issue is budgets excluding children. I mean, I've been retired for five years now, but I, I worked in children's disability. And we always had a big problem when we had a child who needed a special bed. You know, perhaps a very um, a child with, with really considerable um, disability and they couldn't sleep in a normal, normal bed. And we'd always have to jump through hoops to get a bed for, for such a child. Because although there was a budget in the health board for special beds, it was only for people over 18. So I hope I've kind of persuaded you, children do get left out. They get left, left out all the time. Um, and it, sometimes it's deliberate, but often it's just a default thoughtlessness that children are just not very important. Um, and this is a I love this quote, it's from 1783, when sick children are admitted promiscuously with adults, the former never have so much attention paid to them as the latter. And so really we've been at this a long time. Age blindness. This is when you ignore the fact that children are different and because they're, you know, they're developing, they're growing, uh, this means they have needs that adults don't have. Um, and if you can, if you don't take into account those those different needs, um, you won't. You, you you will actually end up either excluding them or just not meeting their needs, and sometimes even harming them. Um, an example is uh, it's a problem that comes up again and again and again uh, in 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 clinic spaces, 
um, not so much in the children's hospitals that's separate, but in community um, clinics, which are big shared buildings with lots of others, you will find that a drug and alcohol clinic has yet again scheduled a clinic to run the same time as, for example, a paediatric um, speech and language therapist. And um, that's not a child friendly environment. Um, you might have people uh, um, being aggressive, uh, uh, people who are uh, uh, withdrawing, uh, etc. people with significant mental health problems. And they don't mix with under fives very well. And what happens is that parents just don't come and children uh, miss out. And this is a message we keep having to give people, you know, please have a look what else is happening at that time. And if it's a children's clinic, it's a no-no, you can't, you can't do that. Um, lack of opportunities to play, I think, is a really important one. Uh, I don't know if any of you work in education, but over the past perhaps 25 years, schools have consistently uh, shortened the breaks that children have to play in, in school, both the, the mid-morning, mid-afternoon breaks and particularly the lunch break. Children barely have time to get to the toilet and shove a sandwich down themselves. They have no opportunity to play, to socialise. Um, and then we get irritated with them because they're fidgety in the afternoon and they get fat. And you think, well, you know, what do you expect? Um, and it's all even outside of school, uh, although we have playgrounds and we might think that's great, I think the way we approach playgrounds is all wrong. In Rotterdam, they have designated the whole city a play area, except for areas that are specifically designated not for play. What this means is it means play is not a nuisance. It's not something that kids have to do separately and over there and not, not, not to annoy adults. Um, we, we're very lucky in Wales. We have a fantastic organization called Play Wales who've been wonderful advocates for play and they have pushed um, this up the agenda both in Welsh Government and in the County Councils and we are actually doing a lot better on play than other parts of the, the, the UK but you know we're still not great. Um, another example might be tolerating children so you might say children are welcome here but actually if you don't make appropriate adjustments for their needs um, you in fact exclude them. This is a picture of Penarth Marina um, and there are very few families with small children choose to buy houses choose or flats in this um, in this development and it's because the barriers between uh, all the all the walking areas and deep water just aren't childproof um, and you, you just you're just not, not, not going to risk that um, so they, they might as well have a have notice up saying no children here all right children are stereotyped and they're particularly this is true of children who are in poverty they are stereotyped and demonized this um i thought i'd let my other other daughter um shine she won a prize for this when she was eight um it was a race equality council um uh, call for pictures for their diary and i and um i didn't really talk to her about this i said to her what, what it was for and then she came up with just this really such a lovely but simple and such a true message we are all different and children are all different um i guess the older ones amongst you will have heard of Bryn Estyn and the waterhouse inquiry and i'll just for the younger ones i'll just tell you we had a terrible um sex abuse scandal in north wales in a care home for boys where there was um a sort of formal exploitation of uh, the boys there for uh, sexual use of men who were in the surrounding area, um, including a, uh, uh, I can't remember what, he was an inspector, Inspector Anglesey, um, he's, he died in prison a couple of years ago, but he, he initially um, won £350,000 worth of libel because the, um, I think his son and um, Private Eye said he was paedophile and he said he wasn't, in fact, he, he was and he, he did eventually go to jail um, but it was a formal sex ring and the Waterhouse inquiry was an inquiry into how the hell this had happened um, and because of the Waterhouse inquiry that's the reason Wales was the first part of Britain to get a children's commissioner but one of the things that came out in that inquiry was that those boys had told people time and time and time again what was happening to them and nobody believed them because they were they were they were bad lads. They were damaged goods, and they lie, and so you can't believe what they say. Um, and another big problem we have in in Britain is that we um, children who are not behaving as 
how adults might like them to behave are generally, if they're lucky, they might be labeled mad or sad, but they're generally labeled bad. Um, and these are often children who have experienced quite significant and serious trauma in their lives. And trauma makes children behave in particular ways. Um, it can affect brain development and, and it can leave children who are still living in, with it in a constant state of post-traumatic stress disorder. And so they can present as um, fidgety, uh, poor concentration, impulsive anger, etc. And this language is misread, misread all the time. Uh, instead of distress, it's read as badness. Um, and so children who come to school severely traumatized are often then secondarily traumatized by very simplistic punitive approaches to their, their behavior management. Um, and we really need to do a lot of work in, in Wales on getting trauma informed uh, schools and trauma informed services. I'm very pleased to say that there is a um, fantastic group going in Gwent who are doing just this. And I very much hope that can, that can uh, be extended to the rest of Wales. But as I said, it's particularly pernicious in respect of children growing up in poverty. Um, uh, children in poverty are much more likely to be abused. The reason for this is that all forms of interpersonal violence, um, you're more likely to be a victim if you're living in poverty. The reason for that is poverty is extremely stressful and people with layers and layers of, of stressors um, will often uh, have mental health problems, recurse to drugs or alcohol as a coping mechanism, and um, that can often spill out into violence. All right, deficit model of, ch of childhood. This is where children are seen as immature and incapable. And I, I always find it fascinating when you meet people with this idea that somehow children are um, uh, uh, just cooking away in a kind of chrysalis soup up to the year 18th birthday and suddenly they just emerge as this perfectly formed butterfly. Of course, this is not what children are doing. Children year on year are gaining competencies, gaining understanding, um, uh, gaining knowledge um, and gaining maturity and judgment. And all, all through their childhood, they're, they're changing and, and acquiring more and more um, capabilities. Losing capabilities too. There are things that you have in childhood that you, you kind of lose later on, which is kind of sad, but that's that's the way of it. Um, the first thing I've got in the list here is denial of right to protest. And I'm going right back to the second Iraq war here, where there were enormous protests against that war. And it included a lot of um, six formers who felt that this war was wrong, felt like many adults that this war was wrong, and they went out onto the streets to protest. We had a particularly unpleasant guy who's um, chief education advisor to Tony Blair. Uh, why he chose this man, I don't know, because he had actually uh, had an affair with a six former when he'd been in teaching. Um, and he came out and said that all the six formers who'd um, protested against the war should be sacked, uh, not sacked, rather, um, uh, expelled from school. And this was really uh, very silly of him because it showed such a cognitive dissonance in the, the British elite, because at that time, our forces were full of 16 and 17 year olds, uh, some of them um, pretty near the front line at that time, as we're going back to the early 90s. Um, and those children actually were very capable and with hindsight were um, rather more right than, than our then Prime Minister. Um, Lack of participation in decision making. There's a plethora of advice and guidance when you look at this. Uh, um, if, you, if you Google participation of children, you will just find guidance after guidance after guidance. We have made progress. We've made a lot of progress. And a lot of this has been led by um, people like the Children Commissioners and other agencies involved in, in, in supporting children to participate. Uh, like, for example, Funky Dragon, that no longer exists, but it was a, a sort of children's parliament in Wales, and it was fantastically good at involving children um, and feeding their, their views into some sort of quite big, big decision-making processes. They've not been, um, oh yeah, I just need to go back a bit, really. My point about the younger children, um, I've done quite a lot of work in, in health on getting people to, uh, get children to participate in decisions about their own illness. Um, and even, even a child as young as two and a half, by asking them, can I, can I feel your tummy? Can I listen to your chest? 
that's in that late enabling them to participate because it's giving them a, a voice. It's giving them a chance to say what they want and what they don't want. Um, and actually also makes them a lot more compliant with your wishes rather than just kind of diving in on them and, and doing stuff without even warning or telling them. It doesn't necessarily mean that a four-year-old is going to say, I don't want you to do that. And you'll say, OK, I won't because you don't want me to. You might then have to say, I'm really sorry, but we have to do this because if we don't, you're going to get very sick. Um, and so you, you build on um, that until by the time most children are 13, they are deemed in health uh, mature enough to give consent to some quite serious um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, things like even a termination of pregnancy without uh, parental knowledge. Um, and by 15, you, you, you assume all children have that, that level of participation. It's interesting that in schools, children have no, no rights of participation at all. The rights are all of parents and I really think education needs to get its act together and you know improve participation. I know that there are people like um, Fian Barrance who works at Cardiff University who are very interested in, in that and um, making children's voices bigger. Um, there's some academic reports, not that many, I'm just going to look at three because they each give a, a little different message. This was one done in 2003 which was 12 years after we'd ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child it was a very interesting um, little exercise, really. The, the authors contacted every single trust and health authority in the United Kingdom. Only 27 consulted children on services for chronically ill or disabled children. And I can promise you, by the time a child has been ill or disabled for 10 years, they actually have quite a lot to say about how well or not well you're doing in terms of looking after them. Um, what was really cynical about this is that 16 of this 27 did nothing with those consultations. They just went in a drawer. Um, 11 went on to use what the children had said and build what the kids had said into their policy. And I think those 16 were, were really exploitive and really uh, cynical, really. It's like, well, look, aren't we great? But in fact, no, you, no, you weren't. Um, this was um, another paper from 2010. And this was um, actually very good. Uh, um, consultation with a lot of children looking at how they could make school environments better um, and it failed not because the children um, didn't come up with some really good ideas it's because difficulties in how their views were received by the adults around them um, and that continues to be um, a difficulty uh, and then this is a literature review published in 2013 and this looked at participation of disabled children um, and what that found was that if you were a disabled child, you must much less likely to be involved in a blanket participatory exercise, trying to find the views of children. If you're a black disabled child, you were even less likely. Um, and that's really kind of a good example of, of, of multiple oppressions, multiple discriminations, meaning that sometimes some of the most vulnerable disabled children um, just have no, no say at all. And it, interesting, there's a tweet recently by Charlotte Church pointing out that has anybody asked children how they feel about going back to school? And I think it was a point very well made because I still yet to hear anybody report on children's views. I don't know if anybody else has. Victim blaming, this is when we blame children for harm that really we, we either um, cause or allow. Uh, road traffic accidents, uh, children don't mix with traffic. All the evidence shows that the only way to keep children safe is to separate them from traffic, particularly um, children who are under nine. Uh, and yet we continue to overemphasize the importance of children's behavior. Now, this is a very old paper, 1994, but I'm including it because it really made a very important point. It said that children are blamed because the traffic lo lobby was too powerful and too rich for any policymakers to take them on and it was much easier to concentrate on children's behaviors rather than uh, how we set up our road systems. Uh, Lolita syndrome, this is a term I've made up, but it's about how we blame children for their own sexual abuse the Newcastle case was one that I remember reading about and feeling very upset at the time. It was mid-90s. 
Um, it was a 10 year old child who had been raped and the adult man who, in his early 30s who had raped her, he was given a suspended sentence initially. And the, the, the report from the judge said, I gather she is not exactly an angel herself. Now this was overturned on appeal and it was said that you know the judge should never have made this remark, but it was a really an insight into how people who really ought to have known better and had a huge amount of power were thinking about children. The grooming gang scandal, I'm sure you are all very familiar with. I, I, some of you would have seen um, uh, that really powerful film. Um, I can't remember if it was two girls or three girls now, but um, it was the one about the Rochdale um, grooming scandal. And, and what we know from all those, those um, grooming gang cases is that police didn't listen to these girls. Uh, they were labelled as child prostitutes, which somehow meant that they were prostitutes rather than children. They were blamed for their own sexual grooming and their own sexual um, uh, abuse. Uh, and it, this uh, went on for years and hundreds and hundreds of children, probably thousands, have been um, involved. And as we know, again, they were children of poor families, often girls who had been in care, who'd had histories of neglect and abuse in the past. And they were vulnerable, often extremely immature in many ways, sexually mature, obviously, um, but in many other ways, uh, very immature, um, often stuck in a traumatized period earlier in their lives. Um, and I think that's just a terrible scandal that Britain is gonna have to live with, that, we, that, that that was our response <clears throat> to these girls. I hope things have changed now. Um, something I met often as well was a misreading of maladaptive responses to sexual abuse. And I can give you an, one example that always stayed with me. It was a case I gave, um, uh, um, it was a witness for uh, in terms of the medical findings of a, a girl whose mother had fled violence, leaving her living from the age of nine to 12 with her father. Um, he would use her for sex whenever he didn't have um, a girlfriend and eventually she disclosed this to a teacher and uh, she was taken into care and he was prosecuted. Um, now this girl, um, like the girls I was mentioning, although she was 12, she was a very, very immature um, girl behaving more like a nine, 10 year old. Um, and presented really as a, as, a, as a child when she was with women. But as soon as a man came into the room, she became coquettish and flirty. And some of the barristers, some of the policemen, uh, they were kind of saying things like, oh God, you know, you can see what she's like. I mean, you know, can you blame him and all this sort of stuff. And what they were missing was what this was. This girl had learned that when she behaved like this, her father was less likely to be violent. And so this was a response to his abuse that kept her safer when she was in that very toxic duo that she was in for three years. But it was a response that really made her incredibly vulnerable once she came out of that into the rest of the world. Um, and you know, she had to have work really to, to unlearn and learn that. So we do blame children for their, their own sexual abuse. It's quite horrible. Um, child poverty is another very important area where we blame children. Um, for really a state that we have imposed on them. And the neoliberalism is, I don't need to tell you lot this, but it's really bad for children. Uh, some countries make a decision to protect children from free markets. Both United Kingdom and Sweden, they have similar levels of child poverty before tax transfers. Um, after tax transfers, our levels remain huge. Sweden's are down at around 5%. Um, it's a policy choice. And since 2010, since the Cameron government came in, number of children in poverty, <coughs> excuse me, has gone up from 2.8 million to 4.1 million. Just, just, I'll just pause here. 2.8 million was around 18, 20% of all our children. And people applauded Gordon Brown for getting our child poverty levels down from 38%, which is where they were under Thatcher and major governments, down to around 18, 20%. What he did was get child poverty rates down from horrific to awful. 
Uh, and I remember I was at a conference um, in around 2002 and there'd been a election in Norway uh, not long before that. And um, one of the top election issues in that, in that Norway election was that their child poverty rate had gone up from two to 5%. And that was causing the Norwegian people um, a great deal of concern. Thanks. Um, so you, you sort of get to get a feel of where Britain is sitting. You know, we think it's great to get child poverty down to 20%, whereas Norway think it's awful when it gets up to 5%. Anyway, coming back to the current numbers, 2.2 million of those children are in families with at least one working adult. So all this work makes you free rubbish that uh, we heard from Ian Duncan Smith, it's all complete nonsense. Um, and our response to child poverty is all based around rescue. And I'm sure you've heard at the moment, people are talking about how do we help poor children catch up with missing out on school in the lockdown, they were put further behind, blah, blah, blah. It's all around rescue. It's all about promoting social mobility. We do things like, we think about somebody like Alan Johnson, and we say, well, here's a man who had terrible deprivation and trauma as a boy. Um, and at the end of it, he grows up and becomes a very successful politician. Um, well, if he can do it, why can't they? What are they missing? What's wrong with them that means they can't escape like this? Um, oh, they lack resilience. And so then there's this huge resilience industry, promoting resilience. It drives me absolutely mad. Um, instead of promoting resilience, what we should be doing is, is, is providing children with what they need. We know what children need, and so we just should be providing it to all of them. And it means our policy around child poverty is always based on the exceptional when it should be framed around the ordinary. And only when it's framed around the ordinary will we, um, will we really, I think, improve things for children. And, and when, we, when we stop talking about social mobility, we, we need, social mobility is not an aim, it's an outcome. It's an outcome of much more equal societies. And I just think we should drop it um, and, and talk about making the lives of people um, uh, in the lower income groups decent and they have decent enough income, decent enough housing, decent enough public services to have decent lives. Um, OK, poverty has overwhelming evidence of harm. This is the victim blame stuff. These are some of the outcomes that start to show in um, teenage years. Uh, we condemn children to this but we also blame them because we're very punitive in our response to all of these um, uh, happenings in children. Right, internalized discrimination. Um, this is an example of internalized discrimination in Nelson Mandela's book, Long Walk to Freedom, where he describes an incident where he gets on a plane, and it's when he's in exile before he went to prison. Uh, he gets on a plane and he panics because the pilot is black and he's sitting there thinking I'm the chairman of the ANC and even I am thinking that actually a black person is incapable of flying a plane. Actually any group does this uh, you know disabled children feel they're less worthy than, than um, able children uh, etc um, and children they, they, they internalize what we tell them about themselves so this is another really awful example from the Waterhouse Inquiry, uh, the, the scandal at Vinestin. It came out in, in, the, in the research into, into what had gone on in those homes. And remember, a lot of these children in these care homes were in care because they had been um, abused in their families. They came into care to be protected. They had experienced a lot of physical abuse in the care homes, you know, heads down the toilets, flushing, um, flushing their faces, um, hitting them, um, beating them, you know, whatever. There was a lot of really unpleasant physical abuse. Um, and they were asked, why didn't you report this? And their response was, well, why would we? I mean, you know, I mean, children get hit. And so they just saw that as normal. That was their lives where the children were hit and that was normal. Um, and I think when children have a view of themselves as, as having nothing to contribute, uh, and, and they increase their sense of passivity and helplessness and lack of agency. When children are in danger, that again puts them in, in more danger. Exploitation, um, 
children are exploited in many ways. Um, they're exploited sexually, both privately and commercially, as we've already talked about. Um, political, before the war fell down in 1990. Um, again, the older ones of us can remember this, uh, the domination of athletics in the Olympics and World Championships by East Germany. And what East Germany did was uh, pick um, promising children as young as the age of six, put them into academies where they were then just developed into athletes that would show the glory of, um, of uh, East German communism. Uh, they were given a lot of hormones. Uh, there was one, um, she was a female, either shot putter or discus thrower. And she was so masculinized by all the drugs that she was given as a child that she opted to um, uh, have sex changes because she just was unable to live her life as a woman. Uh, it, it wasn't something she wanted, but it was the only way that she could live in, in the world. Child labour, uh, well, obviously lots of ways children are exploited for work and you know, Vietnamese children being trafficked here for to work in uh, cannabis farms and then they're arrested as criminals because our age of criminal responsibility is so low. Um, but it, child labour is not something that simply happens to children on the margins. All our children are exploited by a education system that uh, is outcomes and test orientated. And children, instead of becoming, instead of being children in our school system, they have become a, a, a primary resource, which must be turned into a product. And that product is exam results or getting into medicine, medical school or getting into Oxbridge. And that's all schools are interested in because that, that's the way they get money. It's something imposed on them. Many of them really hate it. Um, but I'm sure all of us who have children, older children, will have been guilty of um, perhaps buying those cramming things for GCSE. Lots of kids have tutors. Um, it's a whole industry. And at, 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 at the bottom of this is what field called education as endless labour. Um, indirect discrimination, I'm not going to talk about this in any detail here because it's a completely different lecture. But I just wanted to show you that um, if you look down the left side, you can see the primary focus of discrimination is either girls, it might be parents, it might be disabled people, etc. Um, and children um, get affected by that because um, they're, they're reliant on other people to care for them. And if their parent um, is affected by um, discrimination, that disadvantages them, that, that feeds down. Um, to, to the children. And for example, looking at black and ethnic minority communities at the bottom, um, you are much uh, more likely to be poor if you're a black child because of structural racism in our society. Um, you have increased risk of being care. Uh, sorry, I meant to change this because what they should read now is 25% of looked after population in England, I can only get the English figures, are of um, BAME uh, ethnic minority origin. Um, and it, 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 it's, it's not a huge overrepresentation, but it is an overrepresentation. Um, they can have poor access to healthcare and often do uh, lots and lots of reasons for that. Um, and often they're not very well protected by the care system either um, if, they're, if they're in positions where they might be harmed or neglected. Um, so, that, you know, that is racism affecting children, either because of the effect of racism on people they rely on, their carers and parents, or because they're experiencing it directly. So I said at the beginning, children experience multiple je jeopardy. Um, direct discrimination against them always compounds the indirect discrimination. And so a child can be disabled, belong to an ethnic minority community, be living in poverty, and have a parent with mental health problems. Now, some of you might think oh, that's a bit silly. No, it's a bit too complicated. Uh, can I tell you, when I worked, I worked in the docks area of Cardiff and then latterly I, I worked in Splot Trowbridge area. This was my bread and butter children like this. Children living in very complicated families where um, there was a lot going wrong for families. Um, I mean, I, I could I can think of one child who uh, I can add in um, domestic abuse. I can add, add in that her mother was a forced marriage. She was married at 18 to a man of 60, brought in from another country. Um, and this was a child who uh, 
who um, eventually got excluded from the then school for severe learning difficulties because her, her, her hair, her clothes and her wheelchair were so infested with cockroaches that she presented a health hazard to the other children. And we had been jumping up and down for years saying this child has been neglected and the social workers just couldn't, they were just sort of paralyzed really by the complexity of it and kept just saying it's cultural, it's cultural, it's cultural. Um, and, and actually I was accused of being racist. I can't tell you how many times in the course of that um, particular um, child's um, progress through the system. Um, and you know, you just have to sort of not care and think, well, it's more important that this child is protected than um, people think I'm a good person. Um, and, and my view of it was that actually the racism was perpetrated by social service on this child. You know, they were focusing on, on the parents, uh, whereas in fact they should have been focusing on the child. So these kind of com complicated and complex situations are common. They're, they're, they're not rare. Um, and as I've said, they can be paralyzing for service, services and leave children in danger. And to give some examples, um, I've already talked about um, the Waterhouse the water Inquiry. These were children who were failed very badly because they were being abused and they were in the care system. So that meant, you know, there was a double whammy there that, that the services just didn't get around. Baby P, some of you will remember from 2007, who, um, uh, who was a national inquiry um, into his death. Uh, he, he had his spine broken um, and uh, it was a horrible case. Um, the complicating fact there was maternal learning, learning difficulties and everybody um, overestimated um, this mother's capabilities and um, underestimated how enthralled she was to the men who were in her life. Um, just want to make the point that these national inquiries, uh, they are inquiries of children whose deaths are very high profile and the government thinks that there are lessons from this death that everybody can learn from. We have between one or two children dying every week from abuse or neglect and there is a, an inquiry into all of those but that's it's at a local level not a national level um, but I do think these national inquiries give, give the lie that these deaths are rare when, when in fact they're not. And in fact, at the time baby P got killed, uh, there was a death in the heath of a child from Merthyr with almost exactly the identical injuries of, of a broken spine. Um, but, you know, nobody heard about him. Um, I did a paper um, back in 2002, which was we, we pulled together three cases from South Wales of, of um, BAME children um, where the, there had all been serious case reviews. These children hadn't died, but they had come to very serious harm. And we analysed these cases, actually finding out what was it about their BAME um, status that meant they had been so badly protected. Um, Victoria Climbier, uh, again, the older ones amongst you will remember this absolutely terrible case of a child who was um, given by her Sierra Leonean parents to a visiting relative from London. They picked the brightest of their ch children, a girl, and asked, could she please bring her back to London so she'd get a good education? Um, this woman was very happy to do this, but in fact, her interest in Victoria was the child benefits. And she and her white boyfriend um, slowly tortured this girl to death over about eight months. And honestly, the, the, the failings that were, that were um, uh, recorded in this inquiry were, were, were just beyond um, and I, I remember one particular um, instant where um, they had they had done this kind of ridiculous thing where you color you know they were they, at a time they were quite simplistic really in terms of, of you know so you had to culturally match social worker with family and so they culturally matched a um, African Caribbean British woman with um, this Sierra Leonean woman. Um, and on one visit from this social worker, uh, she was meant to be seeing Victoria and she didn't, Victoria remained upstairs and uh, it's now known that she was very bruised and injured at this time. Um, but the two women just talked about how terrible it was to be a black woman in Britain. And again, it was a complete loss of focus on the child who was at the center of, of this and allowing other issues to, come to the fore and be more important. Um, and I put foster care, it was informal foster care, meaning she wasn't with her, her parents. Um, and then there's been another recent one in 2017, again, who's a mixed race boy, um, 
there was terrible domestic abuse, which is always a real red flag for danger to the children. And the man who eventually killed him was a drug addict and also a drug dealer. And what the extra thing in this one, which really chills me because there are so many county councils um, approaching chaos and bankruptcy at the moment, was that Northampton County Council were in total mess. Um, and this wasn't the only very high, high profile death they had uh, because their services just weren't working. Um, so this is all very cheerful on Saturday night, sorry about this. Um, I do think you're mad spending on Saturday nights listening to an old woman talk about children, but anyway, <clears throat> here we are. So example two, um, looking at mental health, this is a very particular issue. Uh, I've got a picture of a child here, um, and you can see in the table, this is permanent exclusions by ethnic group um, per 10,000 in England. I'm sorry, the Welsh figures are hard to get hold of, and because we have a much smaller um, ethnic minority population relative to our total population, you don't tend to get these patterns coming out um, very obviously. Um, but you can see that consistently black Caribbean children uh, have been far more likely to be uh, excluded permanently than most other groups. I think the only one higher now is Irish Traveller. I think Romani Gypsy are higher too at the moment. Um, but the child in this picture is not at risk. And the reason is because she's a girl. That these children excluded are almost exclusively boys. And behind this group of permanent school exclusion is another population of children who are temporarily excluded from children uh, from school. And they also have the same um, patterns. <coughs> and this is not about poverty, because in fact, the African Caribbean population as a population is quite a lot less poor than the Pakistani and Bangladeshi's population, um, if, if, if you look at the uh, look at figures. It's not about poverty. Um, and in fact, there's good effort, evidence to link poor performance of these boys with negative teacher attitudes. Um, they're perceived as troublesome and unlikely to succeed. Um, and actually, sometimes teachers don't want success from these children. And it, I don't know if any of you have read Akala's book, Natives. Um, he was uh, brought up as a mixed race child in North London. Um, his father was actually African mother, white, Scottish, but his stepfather was African Caribbean. And he was very involved in the African Bar Caribbean Saturday School, which he said really saved him. But he, he um, has a couple of chapters on education and black children. And it's written very academically, um, but he weaves his own personal experience into um, the, the, the sort of, to support really what academic study has shown. Um, and I'd recommend it to, to anybody really, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very good and powerful book. Um, but these poor school outcomes that are the inevitable, I mean, children, children will perform to the expectations of the adults around them. And so these boys don't do well. Um, and also there's, there's also some evidence that um, they become more and more uh, um, alienated from education and actually failing in education becomes a badge of, of black identity, if you like. Um, and so they drift into unemployment, poor mental health, drug addiction, and inevitably involved with the criminal justice system. And the other point about them is that young British Afro-Caribbean men are much more likely to develop psychosis than their white peers. And lots of complicated reasons for this. But the point I want to make here is that they are much more likely to enter psychiatric care through the criminal justice system and through health, um, which I think speaks volumes about what's going on out there. Um, and this is a uh, this is from David Lammy's recent new report looking at um, uh, um, black children, BAME children rather. Uh, it, it's, it's not just black; it's BAME children in the, in the um, criminal justice system, and. It's been trumpeted that we've got our numbers of children in prison down quite dramatically, and indeed we have. But when you look at this slide, I mean, the numbers are almost exclusively down in white children. And so what has happened is that um, uh, BAME children now make up 45% of the under 18 um, population in secure, um, in, 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 in secure placements in prisons. And that is I mean, it's, it, I think it's even higher than the over-representation in, in America. I mean, it's just quite awful. And, and, and if you look, 
They're, they're overrepresented at every level of the criminal justice system, um, overrepresented in stop, stop and searches. The ones that stop and search are more likely to be arrested. They're then more, if they're arrested, they're more likely to be charged. The white ward, if they're charged, they're more likely to be found guilty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and even in the recent coronavirus prosecutions, um, children were um, more likely to be picked on than adults, and if the black children even more so. So it, it, it continues. So why, why are we so rubbish? I mean, we think we're great in Britain, actually. We think we're you know, good at um, you know, looking after our kids, but we have consistently come either bottom or low to middle of the um, UNICEF uh, um, assessment of well-being in children. Um, uh, and this is scale comparing how children feel in OECD countries. Um, so it's comparing like with like, and we've consistently done badly. Um, and so what are our attitudes? Uh, I'm sure if there are any psychologists, this is very sort of psychology made simple, but we have basically two types of attitudes. Explicit, those are the ones we've thought through, we, we know about them, we're aware that we, we think X or Y. Implicit, our attitudes that we often don't think about, um, we just take them in with a mother's milk. Uh, we're unaware of them, unconscious kind of biases to this, that, and the next thing. And um, I did some work with a very clever psychologist, Greg Mayo, and he, he's continuing to do this work looking at attitudes to children. It's in Bath now. Um, but one of the first things he did as part of this big sort of road to looking at attitudes to children was use Cardiff psychology students um, and, and measure their attitudes. And what we found was that they were explicitly positive to children, but actually implicitly positive to adults. So their, their, their implicit bias was to adults. Um, at least we didn't find um, they, that they were implicitly negative to children, but being implicitly positive to adults fits in with a lot of the things that I've been showing you where children are kind of forgotten and, and left out. Um, now we've been criticized for our attitudes to children. Um, no, hang on, before I get to that, um, I, I think these, these attitudes also feed into a lot of legislation in, in, in both Westminster and Wales, really, um, where we bring in legislation that's either actively hostile to children or children aren't thought of and they get, then get affected um, uh, sort of secondarily. Um, looking at some of these, 1994, um, we brought in incarceration for children as young as 12. Uh, I mean, you go to somewhere like Norway or Sweden, they don't have any children um, under 18, uh, most of these countries um, in, in prisons. Um, they might have some in some secure accommodation, um, but it's not a prison accommodation, it's a sort of therapeutic environment. Um, 1998 Crime and Disorder Act brought in the idea of ASBOs. Now they were meant to not be used on children except in exceptional circumstances, but in fact, what has happened is that they are much more commonly used on under 18s and over 18s and then they added to this bringing penalty notices for disorderly behaviour um, and, and that provision went down to children as young as 10 because our in our age of criminal responsibility is one of the lowest in the whole of Europe. Um, it's just ridiculous. The 2003 Sexual Offences Act was um, not, not necessarily, I mean it was aimed at um, people you know, crimes against children. What they did in that act was make all um, sexual acts involving a child under 16 a crime. And so what it meant was that children under 16 cons having consensual sexual acts were criminals. And this was pointed out before the act was passed. This was a very, very bad idea. Um, uh, and they didn't listen. And you have kind of ridiculous situations of, um, uh, you know, a child of 14 or 13 who's taken an intimate picture of herself and shared that with somebody and uh, she is, and has been found guilty of child pornography. I mean, it's just complete madness. And I think we failed to come to grips with the fact that, unlike in Victorian times when children mostly hit puberty at around 16 but had already entered the world of work at 12, our children now are left in a, in a sort of infantilized situation in school until they're 16, 18. But in fact, they hit puberty at 12. So they're becoming sexually mature much earlier. And we uh, 
weirdly expect a degree of sexual continence from these youngsters that our prime minister is incapable of. And um, I just find this kind of thinking very strange. Um, people have obviously forgotten what it feels like to be um, a, a, you know, a post-pubertal adolescent. Um, 19, 2004 Children Act in Westminster confirmed the right to hit the parents despite a lot of lobbying. I'm very pleased to say Wales has finally, I mean, they've been very late about it, but finally have, um, you know, have outlawed smacking in Wales. Prodi Morgan was going to bring that in much earlier. Uh, Carwyn Jones, I don't know where he was coming from. I think he thought it was a vote loser. Um, I think he, he had this idea that, you know, it wouldn't, he'd lose his working class base if they spanned smacking. And this is ridiculous. I, I had so many working class um, parents on, uh, you know, their children on my caseload who were absolutely against smacking and they thought it was just awful. You know, so th this is again, it's a sort of class stereotype. Um, 2011, uh, under 18s were explicitly excluded from the UK Equality Bill. Again, there was a lot of lobbying to try and get them in. In fact, Tony Blair wouldn't, it wasn't Tony Blair, it was Gordon Brown at the time, but he wouldn't have it. And Harriet Harman, they said, children are covered by the Children Act. Um, uh, uh, and so age discrimination in law only applies to old people. And so you know, children have lost out a protection there. They should have had from that equality bill of discrimination against them as children. And the Children Act is not about it's not about rights. It's not about discrimination. The Children Act is about needs and meeting needs. You know, whereas rights come with a legal obligation from people like us who are there to ensure children's rights aren't violated. And I, you know, I think that was really criminal of the Labour government to 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 to, to, to quite deliberately leave them out. Um, and then latterly, we've had Ian Duncan Smith's horrible welfare for reforms, and he was warned that you will plunge hundreds of thousands of children. I mean, as we've seen, it's, you know, it's over a million now into poverty. And he was warned by children's, um, uh, children's uh, charities uh, and, you know, people, uh, professional organisations working with children. And his response at one um, closed meeting was, it's a price worth paying and it, um, apart from the human cost of this um, economically it's really stupid because Britain will be bearing the consequences um, social so the social consequences the health consequences the economic consequences of plunging these children into poverty over the last 10 years they'll be paying that price for decades um, and there's no sense to it at all um, on any level, except you just, you know, you hate poor people and poor kids just don't, 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 don't matter. Okay, we get examined, if you like, um, we're, we're, we're benchmarked against other countries who are like us in terms of development and wealth. Uh, they, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, they come and see how well or badly we are doing implementing this convention that we signed in 89 and ratified in 91 and in 2008 in the fourth periodic um, examination this is what the committee said they are concerned at the general climate of intolerance negative public attitudes toward children especially adolescents which appears to exist in the state party including the media and may often be the underlying cause of further infringements of their rights so what kind of thing were they talking about well this is the kind of thing they were talking about this is tony blair um, I know we talk about the Labour Party moving to the centre under Tony Blair. Um, for me, that was bad enough. But what that Labour administration did that I think was unforgivable, they were horrendously authoritarian. And the people who, who early on feel, feel that are children and prisoners. Um, and he used stereotype of the, you know, the thuggish working class um, adolescent. Uh, this was a way of him trying to garner votes and I just thought it was really disgusting at the time. I just remember being so angry when I, um, you know, when I saw this. And, and remember this is a time when his own son had been found drunk and disorderly in Trafalgar Square and didn't come to any, you know, no consequences at all really. Um, now we were meant to have been re-examined in 2012 but I think the UN just got behind and, and in fact our fifth one was in 2016. There's a paragraph in their final remark saying the committee recalls its previous recommendations, etc., etc. 
and basically just saying, we said this eight years ago, you have done absolutely nothing about this and it's still a big problem. Um, so in conclusion, I'd say that we are childist um, in many ways and this harms children. Um, and those children most susceptible are those who experience other forms of discrimination as well, as well as those based on the fact that they're young and, and powerless. Um, and really importantly, poverty is the pathway through which many rights of children are violated. Um, we are set to have 40% of our children in poverty by 2022, if nothing changes, and I can't see any sign of of anything changing really. Um, so can you imagine 40% of our children are going to be in poverty uh, and things are not going to be good for them. Um, and we, we tolerate obscenely high levels of child poverty. Uh, and I think for me, uh, I would hope that INDOD would take this on as one of their, I mean, for, for me, if you ask me what are the three biggest threats to Britain, I would say, it's climate change, um, it's uh, the chaos that, that Brexit is going to cause and a no deal Brexit, and it's child poverty. Child poverty is not on people's radars and it should be. It, it, it's, it's actually damaging to the children, but it's damaging to us as, as a society. I think I want to end there. I've probably gone over time. I don't even know how long I was meant to be talking. Um, so thanks very much. No. Oh, you have an excuse. Yes, I had to do it. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> ah, I forgot the last slide. Um, you know this person. I used to send her to school um, on school photograph days, just looking immaculate. And several weeks later, a photograph would appear. Um, in her bag, we should bring it home, this triumphantly dishevelled child, and every single one was like this. But I wanted to put this photograph to say we all have an inner child, and we all need to remember what it was like to be small, how hard it was to stay quiet and still, um, how long a day was, what it was like to feel frightened, what it was like to feel excited, and how alive we were. Childhood is not a practice for adulthood. It is probably the most important stage of everybody's lives. I mean, what happened to me before I was 16 determined who I was after, more importantly than anything else that happened afterwards. So, yeah, that was the end. Sorry, I forgot. That is the end. <laughs>